Hi class, we're going to go into chapter 5 for the integumentary system. And um, it's, it's a pretty straightforward system. It actually uses all of a lot of the same terminology that we were talking about in the last chapter with tissues. So it's a good review and it's a good taste into what we're getting into with all the subsequent body systems because it hits on all of the uh, major ideas when we talk about systems anatomy. So just a quick overview, it's actually the largest organ of our body and 16% of our total body weight, which is kind of gross if you think about it. If you're a 200 pound person, 32 pounds of you is just skin. Kind of crazy. Um, anyways, um, let's talk about the two major components to our integumentary system. You have what's called the cutaneous membrane and the accessory structures. So let's talk about this cutaneous membrane. And I'm itchy because I got sunburned this weekend. So sorry, I don't, I don't bugs or anything. I'm <laughs> just itchy. Um, let's talk about that cutaneous membrane. It's made of the epidermis and the dermis. The epidermis is the stratified squamous epithelium. That's what you see. That's what got sunburned on me this weekend. The dermis is composed of the papillary layer and the reticular layer. The papillary layer is superficial. This is a real art connective tissue. See my dog sniffing around back here. Um, and then the reticular layer is deep to that. That's the dense irregular connective tissue um, that will then connect this cutaneous membrane to the rest of the deeper tissue layers. So the accessory structures are things like hair, nails, all of the glands, the sebaceous glands or oil glands, the sweat glands, the receptors, the erector pili muscles, which give you goosebumps, and something called the cutaneous plexus, which is all of the blood vessels that are associated with the integumentary system. So deep to all of that, we then have the hypodermis. So you have the epidermis, the dermis, and then the hypodermis. The hypodermis is also called the subcutaneous layer. It's also known as the superficial fascia. So this is not a part of the integumentary system. It's kind of the connection between the integumentary system and the deeper fascia that are um, on top of the muscles and, and blood vessels. So this image here basically shows you a good summary of everything. You see the epidermis. You can see the dermis, which is this layer here as the papillary layer has all of those ridges going up into that purple layer of the bottom layer of the epidermis and then the reticular layer which is deep to that that's where we have lots of other nerve endings and structures like that you can see all of the accessory structures like the hair pores um, some of the sebaceous glands and uh, sebaceous glands and oil glands sweat glands um, some of the tetraceptors like the piscinian corpuscles erector pili muscles associated with all the hair fibers Etc. We'll get into all of those structures as we go. So let's talk about functions of the skin. It's there for protection, excretion, body temperature regulation, production of vitamin um, D, also production of melanin and keratin, two major proteins, storage of lipids, as well as sensory input for the rest of the body. This is summarized for you in your book in a little chart that looks something like this. And here is a few review questions. You can pause the video at this point and go back and see if you can answer these questions. I'm going to keep going. So um, this video isn't five hours long. <laughs> so here we go. The epidermis. Quick, quick overview of the epidermis. This is many layers. Um, it's four or five, depending on which area of the body we're talking about. The major cell that makes up this layer is called a keratinocyte. This is the body's most abundant epithelial cell. It's produced by a continuous division of stem cells that are at the deepest layer of the epidermis. And we'll look at how this works. Um, and at, then at the surface, at the superficial surface, it's shed. And that's you know what comes off when you touch your skin. It's dead skin cells. Something, some weird statistic, like 70% of all of the dust in your home is just coming from your dead skin cells gross. Um, all right, the deepest layers of the epidermis form those epidermal ridges, and I'll flip back briefly so you can see those, oops, here they are. See those ridges? That's what we're talking about, epidermal ridges, these little bumps. It's at the deep layer of our epidermis, and that is adjacent to what we call the dermal papillae. The dermal papillae are the projections and the papillary layer of the dermis. 
So those structures are there to increase surface area for better attachment. Those are what makes the ridges on our fingertips um, our fingerprints. It gives us friction so we can grasp and touch things. So there you see what we're talking about, that layer of the epidermis, that deep layer of the epidermis forms the epidermal ridges, and then that superficial papillary layer of the dermis has the dermal papillae. They kind of fit together like little egg crates uh, that you would sleep on. So those fingerprints are basically just a pattern from those epidermal ridges. It's determined by genes. It's also determined by interuterine environment. So if the fetus is like touching things, it could affect the way the loops or swirls form on the fingertips. The unique pattern doesn't change over a lifetime. And obviously they can be used to identify individuals. Um, there are thick and thin layers of skin. So thin skin is the majority of our epidermis. This is what you have on your face, on your arms, on your legs, on your back, etc. Uh, it only has four layers, whereas thick skin is what's covering the palms of our hands and the soles of our feet. Uh, this has five layers, and it's a little bit thicker, obviously thicker, as thick as a paper towel versus a plastic sandwich bag. It's the the general comparison. Here you can see the actual differences between thick and thin skin. Thin skin, if we're looking at the epidermis, it's relatively thin. This top layer called the stratum corneum is not very thick at all. Whereas if you look at thick skin, look how big that epidermis is, and look at that stratum corneum. It's much, much thicker, much, much deeper. Check out these ridges, much more pronounced on this deep, on this thick skin. Here, it's kind of wavy and almost non-existent. Finally, there's this thin, clear layer. You can see a little bit of that clearness right there just below that top layer called the stratum corneum. And that clear layer is that fifth extra layer to thick skin. We'll talk about these layers right now. So overall, the entire epidermis does not have any blood vessels in it. There's no veins, no arteries, no capillaries going to the epidermis. The cells are getting oxygen and nutrients from the capillaries that are in the dermis. So all of those nutrients are getting passed up through the deeper cell layers. The cells with the highest metabolic rate are the deepest cells. The cells that are on the top are dead. So they're flaking away. They don't need nutrients. They don't need oxygen. Those deeper cells, the ones that are closer to the blood supply, are the ones that are still living and dividing. Every seven to 10 days, those cells are recycled. So in other words, it takes seven to 10 days for those cells to migrate from that deep layer to that superficial layer and get shed off. So about two weeks or so um, is how long it takes for those cells to finally fall off. It's not like this is a, a, a finite process where you know every two weeks you look a little bit younger and fresher than you did two weeks previous. It's a cyclical process. So you know this cell is two weeks old and this cell is brand new. You know they're they're scattered all over the place and you would have no way of knowing exactly which is which. So let's talk about these layers and we'll start at the deepest layer, the ones that are still living and are still dividing. This is our stem cell layer actually. It's called our stratum basal. The basal or bottom layer of the epidermis is made of these stratum basal cells. They're attached to the basement membrane, which forms those epidermal ridges, by something called hemidesmosomes. These are the ones that allow for stretching and bending and movement, which makes sense if we think about our skin, it can stretch and bend. Those cells are basal cells, and they're basically stem cells that will divide to create more stem cells and keratinocytes. So there's also Merkel cells throughout this layer, and those Merkel cells are touch receptors that are responding to touch. The next layer, stratum basal is the bottom. Above that, we have stratum spinosum. It's called the stratum spinosum because it's the spiny layer. This spiny layer is about eight to 10 cells thick. And again, they're con those cells are still connected to one another. There are some special immune cells here called dendritic cells. They're there to help fight off infection. Makes sense. As we get deeper into our skin, we want to make sure that there's some protection there to ward off against invaders in case those top layers of skin get damaged. Um, then you have the stratum granulosum. This is the grainy layer. When you look at these cells under the microscope, they look like they have little dots in them. So here's what's important to understand. Those cells at the basal layer are undergoing mitosis, and those are your stem cells. So they're creating more cells, right? And as the cells migrate up through, through the integumentary, through, through the epidermis, they're becoming more dehydrated, and they're drying out, and they're filling with a protein called keratin. 
So the first step to this process is for them to start dehydrating. And that's why they look spiny in the stratum spinosum. So those nice, fresh, plump stem cells, once they get to the stratum spinosum, are starting to shrink and shrivel and look spiny, hence spinosum. The next layer, all of that keratin is starting to accumulate. So you have dots or grains in the cells, hence stratum granulosum in this next layer. These are where the cells are not dividing anymore and there's lots and lots of keratin being built up in them. The cells are starting to flatten out a little bit and the cell membranes become less permeable. In other words, they're not letting stuff in anymore. They're, they're starting to, to thin out. In the deep skin, or in the thick skin, I should say, in thick skin, like the, the palms of our hands and soles of our feet, the stratum lucidum is present. This is, again, only in thick skin. This is that extra layer. This is separating that top layer from the stratum granulosum. This is where those cells are very densely packed with keratin. Finally, the stratum corneum is that top or most superficial layer. It's the outermost. The cells here are completely dead. There can be up to 30 layers of dead cells here, dead keratinocytes. They're all filled with keratin. They're all completely uh, dried out. They're water resistant. They're not waterproof. Uh, so water can still get through them, uh, but it's very unlikely. The dead cells are still connected, so they still form that nice covering, and um, you're still able to lose water through these um, cells. They're, again, they're, they're water resistant, not waterproof. So water can come in and water can also leave the body through what's called insensible perspiration. This is the, the perspiration that you don't even realize that you're doing. Your body's just naturally giving off, excuse me, giving off some uh, sweat. So here you see those layers, stratum corneum, very large and thick skin, uh, cells are tightly packed and dried out. And you see, can see a little bit of that stratum lucidum, that clear layer. The stratum granulosum is that thicker, darker layer. Then the spinosum, you can almost see how some of those cells look a little crazy shaped, maybe a little pokey. And then this very bottom layer is our stratum basal. And then the, the papillary layer of the dermis. So moving onward. Again, here's some review questions. You can pause the video, go back, and see if you can answer those questions. Let's talk about some factors that influence skin color. There's really, uh, there's a couple things. There's two main proteins, and that's keratin and melanin. Keratin is like a yellowish pigment. Melanin is like a brownish pigment. So um, those two are going to obviously impact skin color, and those are controlled by genetics. Um, then you get dermal circulation. For instance, if you're very cold or if circulation's cut off to a certain area of your body, the skin there might appear whitish or bluish in color. You also have the degree of keratinization. So in other words, how many layers of dead cells are there? Um, that's going to affect the overall color of the skin. UV radiation. For instance, myself, I just got sunburned, so my skin's a little pink uh, and red and tender. That's because of the UV, UV exposure. So keratin, as I said, is that orange yellow pigment. It can accumulate in fatty tissues in the hypodermis, but it can also accumulate in the epidermis. It's usually abundant in the stratum corneum of people like myself that have fairly light skin. It's also found in orange vegetables like carrots, sweet potatoes, um, squashes. And in fact, people that eat lots of carrots or lots of sweet potatoes may notice that their skin has an orangish tone to it, especially in those thicker areas like your palms or soles of your feet, and it's just from an accumulation of keratin. The melanin is a brown or black pigment. It's produced by special cells called melanocytes. Melanocytes live in the stratum basal. It's manufactured from an amino acid that you bring in through your diet, um, and it's packaged into little vesicles, and those vesicles, called melanosomes, are then transported or put into the keratinocytes. So the size of the melanosomes, the point of transfer, all of that stuff is going to give you a wide range of skin colors, which is why, you know, really we say you're black or you're white, but am I, am I really white? Like my skin is not white, you know, and a black person's skin is not black. It, there's a, a varying degree, and that has to do with the amount of melanin that's in their cells or your cells. Um, so it's... The melanin is also there as a protective measure. It's meant to provide protection against UV light. 
Um, so it's helping to shade and protect the, the DNA in those nuclei. Here you see those melanocytes. They're again filled with the melanin, which give them that kind of brownish appearance. And the rest of the cells, obviously, um, our cells aren't really purple and pink. That's just a dye that's used when they take the picture of the cells to make them more visible. They would normally just be clear, just so that you <laughs> know. All right, let's talk more about melanin. So melanin can be transferred to the keratinocytes and maintained until those melanosomes are destroyed. So people that have paler skin, the transfer occurs in deeper layers. Darker skin people, the transfer occurs in the, those more superficial layers, which is why you can see more of that pigment. And you also have larger melanosomes. So it's meaning larger groups of melanin are being passed into those keratinocytes. So um, again, light skin people can have um, melanin and, and melanin production. It's just the melanosomes are being transferred into the keratinocytes at a deeper layer, like at the stratum spinosum. Um, as opposed to the granulosome. So there you see the melanin that's packed within those melanosomes and again that transfer process into the keratinocytes happening at varying levels throughout the epidermis. So those melanocytes can vary within body region as well which is why some areas of the body tend to be darker in color than the others. Can be as much as a 1 to 4 ratio or a 1 to 20 ratio. Uh, 1 to one melanocyte for every four keratinocytes or one melanocyte for every 20 keratinocytes. So um, it, again, depends on your overall genetics. It's going to determine that. Differences in the skin pigmentation ultimately result from the amount of melanin that's being produced, not the number of melanocytes. We all have the same number of melanocytes. Some of us just make more melanin than others, and some of us transfer that melanin higher up, which is, again, why skin is darker. Albinism is another factor here. This is the, um, it's a genetic condition where you, your skin cells are unable to produce melanin. So you're not lacking melanocytes, you just can't produce the melanin pigment itself. As I mentioned, blood supply, hemoglobin has a red color um, because of the iron and the blood content. So when that blood flows through the papillary plexus, uh, more blood flows to that region, you're going to get a redder or pinkish color to your skin. Uh, less blood flow to a region is going to result in a paler, whitish, or maybe even a blue color. Um, if there's substantial reduction in blood flow, um, you could have a bluish color, which is called cyanosis. Uh, this is usually appear very uh, evident in very thin skin, like around the lips or beneath the fingernails. Usually, I'm thinking of like little kids when they get out of a pool, and they're like, no, I'm not cold, but you can see their lips are blue. It's, that's called cyanosis. Here you just see the effect of blood supply, and you can see that papillary plexus or subpapillary plexus here, just deep to the papillary layer. It's just a network of veins and arteries that are going to constrict and dilate to regulate blood flow to that area of the dermis. Let's talk briefly about skin cancer. Basal cell carcinoma is the most common form of skin cancer. It originates from that stratum basal, and this is usually a result from mutations due to UV exposure. Uh, there's virtually no metastasis in people that have basal cell carcinoma. Most people survive. It has something like a 99% success rate. Just a, you would never even know, you know, that this is, is cancer unless you were watching for cancer or suspecting um, from other issues. Something like malignant melanoma is very different. This is a very serious form of skin cancer. It's the most dangerous. These cancerous melanocytes grow very rapidly. They metastasize through the lymphatic system, which once those cells get into the lymphatics, they can go all over the body, to the brain, to the stomach, to the liver, wherever. Um, it can be detected early, and the survival rate's very, very high, but if it's not detected and it metastasizes, the survival rate plummets, can be very dangerous. Something like that. You would definitely want to go to the doctor if you had something like that growing on your skin. Again, pause the video so you can go back and answer and review these questions. Let's move in through the epidermis to the dermis and the hypodermis. So between the epidermis and hypodermis is the dermis. There's two main types of fibers. These fibers should sound familiar to you from chapter four. 
You have collagen fibers. They're very strong. They resist stretching. They bend and twist. They're going to limit the flexibility. They're going to help prevent damage. So these are our strong, strength-giving fibers. Then we have elastic fibers. Elastic fibers stretch and recoil. They allow for the flexibility. Um, they get reduced in the aging process, which is why our skin sags and droops and we get wrinkled and all of that. Here you see um, where we're talking about in this dermis. We're talking about this, this area here between the papillary layer and reticular layer. So let's talk about that papillary layer first. It's named for those dermal papillae. Um, it's basically a real R connective tissue, which as you recall, a real R connective tissue is made of our collagen elastic fibers, fibroblasts, fibrocytes, right? All the different types of um, cells. There are capillaries, lymphatic vessels, as well as neurons in this papillary layer. So if you cut yourself and you're bleeding, you've probably cut into the papillary layer of your skin. The reticular layer is an interwoven mesh of dense irregular connective tissue. So here's collagen and elastic fibers, and there's lots of blood vessels, and there's lymphatic, and there's even hair follicles and sweat glands. So this is much deeper into the body. There's also fibers um, that can blend in through the papillary layer and the hypodermis. So this is Again, a connection point between what we have going on superficially with the epidermis and papillary and what's going on deeper with the hypodermis. Again, very irregular, dense irregular connective tissue. Let's talk about the hypodermis. This is separating our skin from those deeper structures. It's allowing for independent movement of the skin. In other words, I pick this up and I'm only picking up skin. I'm not picking up the muscles and tendons and stuff that's below it. Um, and it's majority adipose tissue. It's very important for energy storage, even though most of us are not in love with having lots of adipose tissue on our bodies. It's a necessary thing. You need it. We all need it. So adipocytes, as we mentioned, just little balls of fat droplets. So the adipose accumulation pattern can be determined um, by our genders, really. Uh, in men, it's usually on the neck, arms, lower back, buttocks, women, it's usually in the breast, hips, thighs. Um, for both sexes, very few fat cells are on like the backs of our hands or the surfaces of our feet. Those are mostly sensory, so um, fat's not going to accumulate in those areas. The abdominal region is also very, very common. You're going to have more adipocytes in those areas is what that means. You also have sensory receptors that are involved in your integumentary system. So you have free nerve endings, which are sensitive to touch and pressure, and those basically live in between the epidermal cells. And you also have tactile discs. These are for texture, uh, pressure, steady pressure, um, and these are in the deeper layers of the epidermis. So let's look at some of these. You have Meissner's corpuscles. These detect a light touch. They're found in the papillary layer of the dermis, they can detect pressure and vibration as well. You have Pacinian corpuscles or lemelated corpuscles. These detect a deeper pressure and deeper vibration. This word, uh, and the reason I refer to them as Pacinian is because the word Pacific, like the Pacific Ocean, reminds me of Pacinian. And the Pacific Ocean is very deep, and that's what these lemelated corpuscles are, this deep pressure and deep vibration. So I make a little word association there. Then you have Ruffini corpuscles, which are sensitive to pressure and stretching. When you're playing rough, when you're roughing someone up, maybe you're pulling their skin a little bit. Um, and so I think of stretching the skin with Ruffini corpuscles. I always try to come up with word associations for these terms. So here you can see what they are and a little bit what they look like. And again, these are just artist renditions of what they look like. It's, it's as close to what they look like as they can get without you know, it actually being a picture. Lines of cleavage does not refer to what you're thinking. It has nothing to do with a woman's mammary glands. It has everything to do with uh, surgeons and where they cut and how they cut for surgery. If you've ever had surgery before, you might say, well, why did they cut it on a diagonal? You know, why, why did they do it like that? Or why did, why did they do it straight up and down across, you know, my knee or whatever? Uh, and they, they do this because our skin has in it underlying patterns of 
uh, tissue organization. So the collagen fibers in one area of the body tend to go like this, and the collagen fibers in another area of the body tend to go like this, and the collagen fibers of another area of the body tend to go like this. And so it makes sense for these surgeons to know how the collagen fibers go so they can cut in that direction so the healing process is accelerated and scarring is minimum. Because remember, scar tissue is basically just collagen reforming. So they want, it, want the collagen to reform as easily and as uniform as possible. And that's really all it is. It's just looking at how these fibers move in the body. And th this is just a picture of it. Obviously, I'm not going to give you a test and say, where are the lines of cleavage on this particular area of the body? But it's just important to know what lines of cleavage are and why it's important, especially if you're interested in going into a surgical field. Here's review. You can pause and go back and answer those questions. Moving on. Let's talk about burns for a little bit. They're very significant. Probably one of the worst injuries you could endure. Uh, you can get a burn from heat, from friction, from radiation like sunburn, uh, from shock, or from strong chemical agents like pouring uh, some type of acid onto your skin. You can get a chemical burn. So it's very damaging to um, your skin to have a burn, and it's not just your skin that's going to suffer. You're going to suffer from dehydration because remember, the overall function of your skin. Your skin is there to keep water in, to ser serve as this water-resistant barrier. So without that barrier, you're going to lose water and dehydrate. You're also going to have an electrolyte imbalance because of the dehydration. So those two things can, in fact, in fact impact your kidneys uh, and your circulatory system. So I was going to sneeze, sorry. Um, the severity of the burn is going to depend on how deep that burn went, how many tissue layers it went into, and the total area it ha that has been affected. So a first-degree burn is like, what I have. It's like a sunburn, right? This is just the surface epidermis that's affected. Sunburns, you know, they can be painful. You have some redness, maybe some inflammation if it's a really bad sunburn. Um, and it's called erythemia, uh, which is just, you know, redness is basically what it translate to, translates to, but it doesn't go deeper than the epidermis. So that, that's kind of the key to a first degree burn. A partial thickness burn or a second degree burn, this is where most of the, or all of the epidermis and some of the dermis have been impacted. So the accessory structures aren't affected. You could have blistering, pain, and swelling with this. So this would be like a really bad sunburn um, where you get some blisters and um, healing can take up to two weeks with this. And sometimes you might even have scar tissue from it. Again, going into the upper levels of the dermis. A full thickness burn or a third degree burn is destroying the epidermis and the dermis, and then the damage is going into the hypodermis. It's actually less painful because your sensory nerve endings are destroyed. You don't have any sensory nerve endings anymore. Um, the epithelial cells are unable to recover and usually have to have a skin graft to fix the burn. Um, again, burns are very much impacting your homeostatic mechanisms with fluid electrolyte balance, as I mentioned, thermoregulation, another major function of skin. Because you have that increased fluid loss, you are going to have increased evaporative cooling. In other words, your body is going to tend to be below temperature instead of where it needs to be. It's going to take more energy to maintain that body temperature. You might um, have to wear certain protective clothing to cover that particular area of your body. So um, one of the most detrimental things about burns is because your skin's your first line of defense, once that's damaged, you're then going to have to do lots of injury prevention and infection prevention because of it. So um, you're going to have to make sure that area stays damp to encourage um, or prevent rather dampness. That's what I was saying. I was like, that doesn't make sense. You're going to have to make sure that area does not get damp because that dampness will encourage bacterial growth. You have to make sure that the skin whatever is left of it is continuous and that there's no breaks because, again, infection can get in there. Sepsis is the rotting of the skin, and it can be a widespread bacterial infection. It can cause death, very, very um, shock. It can be very detrimental. This is just the chart from your book. Let's talk about how to evaluate burns in a clinical setting. So you're looking at the depth of the burn, and that's assessed with a pin. Um, you can use an, uh, the reaction of the pin prick um, 
to determine the loss of sensation. You can also you look at the percentage of skin that has been burned. And you use what's called the rule of nines. It's basically just a method of estimating the surface area. It's obviously modified for smaller children. Um, and I'm not, again, I'm not going to give you a chart and say this woman has this part and this part burned, how much percent of her body and whatever. This is just for reference for clinical settings only. Let's talk about treatment briefly. Uh, obviously, you want to make sure that the person is hydrated and has electrolytes imbalanced, so drinking like a watered-down Gatorade would be perfect. Um, per making sure they get proper nutrients to increase for, because they have increased metabolic demands because of the thermoregulation issues, they're going to need proper nutrition. You're just going to have to make sure um, infections are being prevented, cleaning, treating, antibiotics, et cetera, and possibly skin grafts, making sure that area of intact skin is um, transplanted to cover the burn site appropriately. The skin grafts is when um, there's there could be a split thickness where you're transferring part of the dermis along with the epidermis, or it can be a full thickness where you're taking the epidermis and the full dermis. So again, it, it depends on how bad the burn is and how uh, viable the patient is, um, how able they are to repair themselves um, from a skin graft as well as a burn. So an autograph would be the patient's own skin. An allograph is frozen skin from a cadaver, and a xenograph is using animal skin, usually like pig skin. Um, very possible you might say, well, I don't want some, someone's dead skin on me or a pig skin on me. Uh, wait until you have a burn, and then you just want to be healed and get back to normal. So you, you would take those things. And obviously, with, even with your own skin, you still risk infection and um, issues. But um, that's obviously the best choice unless that's not an option, which it might not be. So let's talk about burn recovery. Young patients with burns over 80% of their body have a 50% chance of recovery, assuming that they have access to medical treatment. Um, and this is all due to advances in cell culturing. And this is a huge area of research, um, getting a uh, basically a skin lab, getting the, the capability to grow skin in a lab would, is, is incredible. And the technology is there, and it is possible. It's just being able to do enough trials and, and making it legal. Um, there's, I will tell you just this quick side note. I know I don't usually do stories in these PowerPoints, but um, when I was in college, I worked, uh, I did a lot of volunteer work at Children's Hospital DC because I went to College Park. And uh, one of the things that we did, we would go in and we would just do like arts and crafts and like spend time with the children. And I would say 70 to 80% of the children at Children's Hospital were burn victims. Burns were so rampant down there and I, I don't know why I don't know what the causes were I didn't really talk to the children about you know how they got burned because I didn't want to upset them but um, I will say that it was very sad to see that many children with you know those types of scars that are going to last their lifetime so it definitely left an impact on me again one of the reasons why I wanted to um, help people by being a teacher so here's your review. Again, pause the video and go back and answer those questions. We're moving on now. We're talking about accessories to the skin. Um, and I'm skipping through the learning outcomes because those are already covered in the module for you. These accessory structures are also called epidermal derivatives because they're basically modifications of the skin cells. They originate from the epidermis. The hair follicles, the exocrine glands, they all di um, differentiate from something called an epithelial column, which is basically like a special thin cord of epidermal cells um, that grow into the dermis. And nails um, basically formed um, from these thickened epithelial cells um, in something called the nail field. And this is all, all of this is located in the dermis. All of the accessory structures are located in the dermis, but they can go through the epidermis as, you know, obviously the case with hair and nails. Uh, so here you see, this is just showing you the derivatives and how it all comes about. Overall integumentary system, the cutaneous membrane we just talked about. Here we're getting into the accessory structures, hair follicles, exocrine glands, and nails, kind of how they originate. Skipping through this, all the same stuff, just broken down in little individual images. So let's talk about hair follicles. Hair follicles produce hair. 
that's an easy one, right? Um, they can also produce hairs that provide touch sensations or protect the skull. That's what this hair is for. This hair is actually there to protect and cushion your skull, right? The hairs on your arms aren't there to protect your arms. They're there for light touch sensations, and we'll talk about that. Your exocrine glands are your sweat glands and sebaceous glands. The sweat glands obviously are there for thermal regulation, help cool you down, sweat's activated, etc. It's also a, a waste excretion method, so your body's getting rid of waste. Uh, and then your sebaceous glands or your oil glands are there to lubricate the skin and the hair. And then you have nails that are there, which are there to protect and support the fingertips and toes. Pause the video, answer these questions. Hair is found almost all over the body. A uh, couple places it's not found, palms of your hands, soles of your feet, uh, sides of your fingers, right? uh, lips, toes, parts of your external genitalia. Um, those are the main parts of your body that don't have hair. And then everyone varies. You know, Some people don't have hair on their calves or whatever. Um, overall, your body has 2.5 million hairs. That's a good question for Jeopardy. 75% of the body is covered. Um, by hair, not just on the head. So it's all over, right? Uh, it's a non-living structure, so it's not made of cells. It's produced by a living group of cells called a hair follicle. It's very complex, uh, made of epithelial connective tissues. All that structure of the hair follicle forms one single hair. So let's talk about the two types of hair on your body, and you would know this just by living your life. You have terminal hairs. Terminal hairs are the ones that grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. Your armpit hair keeps growing. Hair on your head keeps growing, right? Unless you have some type of genetic in, you know, um, inheritance issue or uh, a mutation or something like that, your hair is just going to keep growing. Vellus hairs, these are these hairs, vellus hairs. They're all over your body, all over your body. And, and they can be modified with uh, hormones like guy's face, you know, that obviously gets modified. So uh, let's talk about the parts of the hair. You have the hair shaft. This is actually starting deep within the hair follicle. It, cannot, um, it can be seen on, on the surface. This is the shaft, right? that's what you see, but it starts all the way in there. Then you have the root, which is actually anchoring the hair to your skin. Then the root hair plexus, which is all of your nerve endings that are around the base of the hair. And then you have erector pili. These are the smooth muscles that are attached to the follicle themselves. This is gonna help make the hair stand up on its end when you have goosebumps. So here you see all of these structures, the shaft of the hair, the hair root, which is just that connective tissue that goes deep into, that, uh, into the dermis. This whole structure is surrounded by connective tissue. The erector pili muscle helps, again, pull the, pull the hair um, erect. And hair follicles are always associated with a sebaceous gland to help lubricate and protect the hair. So how does hair form? It begins at something called a hair bulb. It's basically the base of the hair follicle. And the bulb surrounds the hair papilla, which is a little piece of connective tissue that has blood vessels and nerves inside of it. The matrix is where the basal cells are. These are the stem cells that are going to uh, basically divide and create the, the hair. The medulla is the daughter cells that are at the very center of the, what's called the matrix. The cortex is that intermediate layer, and then the cuticle is that outer surface of the hair. So if we look at a cross section here, you can see all the things I'm talking about. The hair bulb is this whole end piece. The hair papilla is where all of these nerve endings and blood vessels are coming in. Then you have the matrix. This is where all the cells are dividing, so the hair is growing out from this matrix. So you can imagine all of these cells are undergoing mitosis and just like the epidermis there everything's getting pushed up pushed up pushed up and so the hair's growing longer at the ends so you have the medulla which is the center then the cortex and then the outermost cuticle the hair is full of keratin the medulla and the core of the hair have a softer keratin whereas the cortex has a hard keratin which is why your hair uh you know unless you know Yes, our hair is soft and silky and blah, blah, blah. But in reality, it's, it's a very hard substance. Um, so it's giving hair its stiffness. And the, the cuticle has very hard keratin on it. Again, just for protection, protecting the innermost stuff. So the internal follicle 
has some parts to it too. There's the internal root sheath and an external root sheath, and then something called a glassy membrane, and it's all surrounded by connective tissue. So if we look at a cross section of the hair, you see this outermost connective tissue. This is, you know, right at the right in inside the follicle. You have this glassy membrane that surrounds the whole structure, the external root sheath, then the internal root sheath, the cuticle, the cortex, the medulla. So hair grows in a cycle. There's an active phase. Each hair is gonna grow for between two to five years. It depends on your gender, it depends on your hormones, genetics, et cetera, et cetera. But then there's a resting phase. Your hair gets to a point where it's like, you know what, I'm not gonna grow anymore, I'm done with this. And it's, it's really the genetics of the follicle that determine that, but then it, it enters this thing called the rest phase, and it detaches from the follicle. And that's when your hair falls out. This happens naturally. Girls, we know this. You brush your hair, and then every once in a while, you're like, ooh, oh, I got this, this guy right here. I don't know where he came from, right? Um, that was a club hair. I wasn't pulling it out. It just, just came out. Uh, and that happens. About 100 hairs a day naturally fall out um, just through this natural hair growth cycle. So variations in this growth cycle are going to deal with, you know, different differing um, genetics and hormones, as I said. So in all, you have this active phase of growth, then it's going to rest, and then this follicle is going to deactivate and turn off, and then it turns back on, and so on and so forth. So it's continuously recycling until something in your genetics turns it off. These are all the same, same thing. So let's talk about hair color. You're probably wondering about that. There are some causes of variation of color. Obviously, uh, this is done by melanocytes, just like your epidermis. It's done through the matrix. The matrix is where the uh, melanocytes, the melanin is kind of living, where it's, where it's found. Different forms of melanin are going to give you different hair colors. Uh, so something like my hair, blonde, doesn't have a whole lot of melanin in it, right? Uh, some people have white hair. Guess what? They have no melanin in it. Um, people with red hair have a different uh, iron-based compound in their hair to give it that reddish color. People that have brown hair or black hair have varying degrees of melanin in them. So um, pigment production is decreasing with age, which is why people's hair kind of dulls and uh, can turn white with age, and that's all based on hormones, environmental factors, and genetics. White hair has no pigments, um, at all, as I mentioned. You can pause the video, answer these questions. We got one last topic, and that is glands. Uh, so let's talk about the exocrine glands of the skin. You have sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands are basically holocrine glands. If you remember last chapter, holocrine means the whole cell is kind of exploding, right, to, to release the, the um, secretion. So it's going to be an oily lipid secretion in the sebaceous gland. This is our oil glands, by the way. Um, it's a simple branched alveolar gland going right onto the, ha the hair follicle itself. Um, and when the erector pili muscles contract, it's kind of squeezing that sebaceous gland. So um, when you get cold or when those erector pili muscles contract, it's inadvertently squeezing, letting some of that sebum out so that the hair can be lubricated as it's um, standing up. So sebum is mostly triglycerides like fat some cholesterol, some proteins, electrolytes, and lysozymes. Lysozymes are those little antibacterial um, enzymes to help protect your body. All there to lubricate the hair shaft. So as I mentioned, uh, typical sebaceous glands, you see the sebaceous follicles just going onto the skin. The sebaceous glands are associated with the hair follicles. Let's talk about sweat glands. These have a watery merocrine secretion. Um, so the myoepithelial cells are the ones that kind of squeeze the gland to give that secretion. There's two main types of sweat glands. You have apocrine sweat glands and merocrine sweat glands. Apocrine sweat glands are um, your stinky sweat glands. So this is like your pubic area, your armpit, right? This is the, the kind of sweat that you really don't want people to smell. Um, it's viscous, it's thick, it's sticky, and it's used to be used in olfactory communication. So it used to be something where humans, and some people still feel like this, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, some people are, are grossed out by it, and some people like the smell. It is just something that humans used to say, hmm, 
wow, that really smells like a man or that really smells like a woman or whatever. And, and you would be attracted to that. We were kind of by our culture uh, taught that that is stinky and gross. So um, I don't mean to offend if I say stinky and gross. I'm just, that's kind of how our culture treats it. Um, but it is very strongly influenced by hormones. And depending on times of month for females, our smells are different. And sometimes males can actually pick up on that if they're paying close enough attention. Uh, there's also ceruminous glands and mammary glands that are apocrine sweat glands. Ceruminous glands are your earwax glands, and obviously mammary glands secrete milk. They have the, the apocrine type secretion where it's just giving out the, um, the secretion itself. Then you have American sweat glands. American sweat glands are all over the body, mostly in the palms and soles, um, controlled primarily by your nervous system, right? You get that fight or flight sympathetic response, you're nervous and you're uh, you know, you're about to, you know, skydive or take a test or whatever, meet someone for the first time, you get a little nervous. And so your palms start to activate. Um, they, there is some antibacterial, antimicrobial action in that American secretion. And obviously this is going right onto the skin surface. It's not associated with a hair follicle. Here you see the two types of follicles, apocrine, mariquin. Um, really, they're just just the two different types of sweat glands. You can pause the video and answer the questions. Now we get to nails. These are thick sheets of keratinized epithelium. You have the nail body, which is all of those dead cells packed together uh, with keratin. So the nail body is what you see of your nail. Uh, there's lateral grooves on either side, kind of sitting your nail into the skin a little bit. The lunula is that pale half moon shape at the uh, proximal end of the nail body and then you have the free edge which hangs off. Mine are pretty short and wimpy so I don't have much of a free edge. The nail root is the fold where the nail production occurs and that, that's you know the part way back there um, where the nail kind of grows from. You also have the epinechium. This is the part of the stratum corneum. We call it the cuticle. It's just that extra part that goes over the ends, edge. And then you have the hypokinechium. This is the thick, uh, thick Blah, sorry, it's very, very late. Um, this is the thickened area of stratum corneum underneath the free edge. So this is kind of, I don't know if you can see, it. it's like the thick part right under there. Right. It's just the extra little pad right underneath of your free edge of your nail. Here you see all of the parts. As I mentioned, lunula is kind of the fun one. Most people are interested to learn what that has a name. There's lateral grooves, the epikinechium are cuticle, the hypokinetium, that extra little pad down there, the nail body, the nail bed is where it all sits, the nail root is where it grows from. Pretty, pretty straightforward. A lot of clinicians use nails as well as skin for diagnosis um, because the, the cells that produce the nails are affected by the same conditions that alter your metabolism. So if you have nails that are pitted or distorted or maybe they're weak or um, they break very easily, it could be a um, diagnostic, like you maybe you're vitamin deficient or maybe you have psoriasis or maybe even a blood disorder, depending on the shape of your nails. This would be psoriasis. Not going to leave that up. It's kind of gross. Answer these questions. Pause the video. Make sure you're keeping up. Um, finally, let's talk about some age-related changes to the integument. At the end of every chapter, we go through some age-related changes, and it's a little bit of doom and gloom, I know, but it's happening to every one of us, believe it or not. As we get older, we have fewer melanocytes, which means our skin is going to get paler. We're going to have increased sensitivity to the sun, more likely to sunburn. Your epidermis is going to get drier because your sebaceous glands are no longer secreting all of the oil like they used to. You also have a thinning epidermis. You have a decline in basal cell activity, so you're not going to have as many epidermal layers. Your stratum corneum isn't going to be as thick, which means your connections between your epidermis and dermis are going to weaken. You're going to be more prone to injury and tears and infection. That also means you're going to have increased or rather reduced vitamin D production. It's going to cause your muscles to be very weak and cause your bones to be more brittle because of that absence of vitamin D. Sorry, I'm just getting fidgety. I'm not used to sitting this long. Um, you also have decreased immune response. Remember those dendritic cells that live in your epidermis? Well, you're, those are going to start declining, so you have an increased risk of sun, skin damage and infection. You also have a thinning dermis because of fewer elastic fibers. Sagging, wrinkling skin, as we all know and love, is 
a result of that. You're also, also going to have decreased perspiration because your sweat glands are less active. That could be a good thing, but that also means you have a greater risk of overheating. You also have a reduced blood supply, so your thermoreceptors are not going to be um, as sensitive. It's going to make you, make you feel cold, even when you're in a warm room. How many of you know an old person that's cold all the time? Probably all of us. Um, and your body has a decreased ability to lose heat, so uh, you're more likely to overheat. So again, thermoregulation is a huge, um, tricky thing with elderly. You have slower skin repair. Instead of three to four weeks, it could take six to eight weeks um, for the same injury. Fewer active hair follicles, means your hair is finer, going to um, fall out much faster. Could be gray or white as well from the decreased melanocyte activity. Hair and fat distribution changes over time. Maybe you don't have as much hair on your head, but you have more on your back <laughs> or more on your feet. Um, again, that's all from hormones and genetics. Same thing with fat distribution. Maybe you never had fat on your hips and now you do. Um, it's just because of age. Here you're seeing some of the um, effects, dry and epidermis, less active follicles, less active sweat glands, uh, reduced blood supply, decreased perspiration, etc. So here's a quick review. You can pause the video and go back and answer those questions. Let's talk about how the um, integumentary system interacts with other systems like the endocrine system. We've talked a little bit about hormones and this will make much more sense later in the semester when we learn about the endocrine system. But the hormones are gonna circulate between the skin and the rest of the body. Things like steroid hormones um, can actually loosen intercellular connections and um, reduce the effectiveness of the epidermis as a barrier. So steroid hormones can impact your epidermis. Thyroid hormones help keep a normal blood flow in that subpapillary plexus, uh, which is gonna help with thermoregulation. People that have thyroid issues tend to be very, very cold or very, very hot all the time, depending on which way, which way they swing. You also have the sex hormones, the um, estrogen, the testosterone, increasing or decreasing epidermal thickness. They have the ability to accelerate wound healing. Usually the sex hormones are increasing metabolism. So the more estrogen or testosterone you have, the, the more quickly things are moving in your body and changing in your body. Increased number of dendritic cells, so you have a higher chance of protecting against cancer cells and uh, pathogens from invading. You also have growth hormones, which stimulate cell growth and division, something called epidermal growth factor, or EGF, which is widespread throughout the epithelia. It's produced by the salivary glands and glands in the small intestine. It's basically there to promote cell division in that stratum basal. Uh, it also produces the, accelerates uh, keratin production, stimulating epidermal growth and repair, synthesis and secretion within the glands. So um, growth hormone is also going to stimulate fibroblast activity, collagen production for scar formation and wound healing. So it's also going to stimulate the basal cell division to thicken the epidermis, ultimately to promote wound repair, wound healing. So this chart goes through all of those significant hormones that I mentioned and summarizes their effects in the integumentary system. I like how your book kind of makes those connections between other systems that will help you with your case studies. Finally, uh, vitamin D3 production comes from the sun. UV light causes those epidermal cells within the spinosum and basal to convert a special steroid into something called colocalciferol. Colocalciferol will be converted into calcitriol by the kidneys. Um, and the calcitriol affects calcium and phosphate absorption in the intestines. So in other words, if you don't have a lot of, of cal calcitriol, you're not going to effectively absorb calcium um, and phosphate in, from, from the food that you eat in your intestines. You won't be able to bring that calcium into your body. Even though you're eating it, it's not going to come into your blood. So it's super important that your body efficiently makes vitamin D3 from the sun. Um, you can also get it naturally from fortified foods. That's why a lot of calcium products are also vitamin D fortified, so that that calcium and vitamin D can just come in together. But you can get it naturally from fish, shellfish, etc. 
this is showing you the overall process. You have sunlight converting a steroid compound that's naturally found in our skin cells into cholecalciferol. It's converted into an intermediary by the liver, calcitriol by the kidneys, ultimately affecting how our small intestines absorb calcium and phosphate. So with an inadequate with an inadequate supply of calcitriol, you can have impaired bone growth, something like rickets in children where you have flexible, very poorly mineralized bones. Not enough sunlight can also um, result in this. Someone who works in an office or someone who uh, doesn't go outside to play, children that just stay inside, uh, can have vitamin D deficiency. The bone matrix is gonna have insufficient calcium, insufficient, insufficient phosphate, Fairly uncommon in the U.S. Uh, because we have vitamin D added to a lot of our products like milk, um, but in other countries it is a very common um, disorder. Again, Rick, it's just making your bones flexible. With vitamin D production, if you have an inadequate supply of calcitriol, again, you could have inadequate bone growth and um, bone repair. So you're going to have increased bone or rather decrease bone density as you get older. So you may have an increased risk for fractures and you may have a slow healing process if you um, bruise a bone or damage a bone in some way. This is a little summary that you can go back and check yourself. You can pause the video and answer those questions. Um, we can also talk about the inflammatory response in skin repair. So how does our skin repair itself after injury? The first thing that always happens is a generalized immune response, which is the inflammatory response. So any injury, any infection, your body is automatically going to go into inflammatory response mode. This is all of those things we talked about last chapter. This is the pain, the swelling, the blood flow increase, histamine and heparin. All of those things are happening in this instance. The initial injury is going to bleed. Mast cells are going to be activated. They're going to stimulate this whole inflammatory process, swelling, redness, heat, pain, as I mentioned. There's this dude got cut on his head, and so we have our little inflammatory response initiating. Then you have what's called the migratory phase. This is where there's going to be a, a small blood clot forming at the surface, and this is just to protect any outside pathogens from coming in. The cells that are deep in the stratum basal, they're going to start dividing. They're going to migrate to the edges of the wound macrophages, those Pac-Men, they're going to come by, they're going to gobble up all the debris, gobble up all the broken cells and all the stuff that doesn't belong there, like the pathogens. Um, there's also something called a granulation tissue that's going to start to form. Uh, it's basically like a, a capillary network of fibrobla fibroblasts, which are, you know, those fiber secreting cells, um, and the platelets basically forming together like a temporary patch over the damaged area. So again, the scabs forming at the surface. Underneath, we have this fibroblast and fibers all coming together, making this granulation tissue. Then you have a proliferation phase. During this proliferation phase, approximately one week from the injury, the scab is going to continue to grow. Uh, phagocytic activity is continuing. The blood clots are going to start to disintegrate. Fibroblast Fibroblasts made all those collagen fibers, formed something called the ground substance. And here you see all those fibroblasts making the collagen, secreting the collagen like the web, right, from Spider-Man, getting it all there. And then finally, the scarring phase. This is when the scab falls off or you scratch it off. They're usually itchy at this point. The epidermis healing has been complete. There may be a shallow depression where the injury was, but now you have scar tissue. It's non-cellular. Material, it's mostly collagen fibers formed from this process. So here's the whole thing, inflammatory, migratory, proliferation, scarring. You have mast cells coming, gobbling up all the extra debris parts, scab, and our granulation tissue, and then the um, fibroblasts continue to secrete the collagen, and eventually that scab falls off. This is just the whole process. Uh, again, I don't know why I put it in there twice. Sorry about that. Uh, let's talk about keloids. Keloids are scar tissue forming beyond repair. So this can be harmless, or it is harmless rather. It's just a thickened, raised mass of scar tissue. It's usually uh, like covered by like a smooth epidermal surface. 
It's usually common in particular areas of the body, so you're not going to get a keloid like on your face. Uh, you could, depending on how your body's chemistry works. Um, this guy here looks like he tried to get keloids to form this really cool pattern on his body, but that, that's what a keloid is. Um, basically, he, he damaged his skin in such a way that it formed these keloids. He did it in a pretty cool pattern. It's kind of like, it's almost like a tattoo, a scar tissue tattoo. Uh, here are your final review questions. You can stop the video, go back and answer these questions. And if you still have questions or if I talk too fast, you can rewatch the video or shoot me an email or post on the discussion page. I hope this helped you. And let me stop recording. See ya.